What's going on, everybody? I'm excited for this one. It's Mark Blake and Baker here to talk about Derek Nicholson, new linebackers coach at Miami. Mark covers Louisville for the Crunch Zone. So we're going to get into these last few years with Coach Nicholson there. Mark, how are you doing here? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on, Chris. I appreciate it. How is uh, Miami treating you? Yeah, Miami's great and just a lot of buzz right now in the offseason, which is what the Miami fan base wants after this 5-7 and seven disappointing year under Mario Cristobal that first year. So changes are coming, new coaches, new players, over 30 uh, new players in the program. We'll see how everything turns out. The coach stuff I, I find very interesting. I enjoy talking to people like yourself that know about these coaches. So let's get right into it with Coach Nicholson. I, and I know the fan base really enjoys these too, Mark. So I'm, I'm glad you're doing this. Coach Nicholson was at Louisville the last three years there. Uh, he did take the job to Cincinnati in December. So it's an interesting uh, offseason for him. But let's just focus on this linebacker play in particular last year. Uh, what, what did you see that the numbers pop off uh, quite a bit with their linebacker play, just looking at the stats? Yeah, you know, it was a really good year for Louisville linebackers. D-Nick was a big part of that. And, you know, he um, – it was kind of a slow start, to be honest. So, like, if you look at, like, what they finished with as the season went on, the beginning of the year, if you watch that Syracuse game, it might be the worst game you'll see little linebackers play all year. And they're playing Syracuse. Momo Sonogo is a transfer from Ole Miss, was in his first game. And then Monty Montgomery was coming off of an injury where he didn't play the last eight, nine games of the year prior. Neither guy looked like them, like the guy we saw like down the stretch. So I think what you what we saw last year and the last couple of years, guys that really just played really hard for him. Like the players really loved him on the field. Like, you know, again, go back and watch Syracuse game, go back and watch the Wake Forest game. You'll watch two totally different games from the defensive uh, thing. And like they for whatever reason, they couldn't tackle against Syracuse. And then late in the year, those guys get a couple games under the belt. They started really hitting, sticking, dropping guys to the ground. And that's what you want to see. Unfortunately for us, it cost us, you know, a game or two early. Uh, but I think if you have him in your program for a couple of years, have some guys that are familiar with your system, not injured, that'll probably help a great deal because they really did play well down the stretch. And and obviously Miami's looking for better play from their linebacker spot. So they're hoping – to get some uh, a different look here with, with different coaching and things like that. You know, with, with Sonogo and Montgomery, the, they led the team in tackles last year. I'm curious about what Nicholson's uh, influence with this might be with the tackles for loss and the sacks. Both guys uh, combined for over 20 tackles for loss. You don't always see that from the linebacker spot. And, and over 10 sacks. So, so great there. Obviously, defensive scheme plays into it. But what, what can you say about Coach Nicholson's impact or influence on those particular uh, statistical marks? Yeah, I think they had two different philosophies with him and Momo, to be honest with you. Momo was a guy that you could send and that would disrupt. And, Mo, you know, Monty was, excuse me, Monty was a guy that you could send and disrupt. And then Momo was a guy that kind of was like, all right, anything comes through these two gaps, I'm coming through there, you know. And so that's what he did. You know, Monty would go through and try to create, you know, just havoc. And or generally speaking, it's not on every play call. But Momo was like, if you get through there, you're only getting a couple. You know, and that's what you want out of your middle linebacker. And Louisville really struggled previous to that with linebackers that would, you know, they they stop a guy two yards short, but they'd fall forward three and a half, four yards. With Momo under D Nicholson, they'd hit and they'd go to the ground. You're not get you're not getting a third and three, getting this, getting contact two yards deep, and then guy falls forward for the first down. With what you were getting was guys that were hitting and then stopping. And, you know, if we had more offense, it would have made a difference. But the defense was not the problem last year for Louisville football, that's for sure. I I am curious, though, like what happened with Charlie Strong? Because we're we're pretty big fans of him up here, as you might remember. We really had it rolling. Uh, and and why, why was he uh, not retained, do you think? Yeah, you know, it, it was interesting. You know, Miami's overall, you know, just coaches on both sides of the ball essentially became – uh, up for grabs in the sense that underperformed. You know, the, the numbers didn't look good all around the board. You know, what, and really all position units, you know, there was some reason or another why they only won five games and, and the numbers just don't look good. And as far as, Char as far as Charlie goes, and certainly we all remember Charlie at Louisville as well. And I remember doing this a year ago, you know, uh, with the Louisville reporter about, about Charlie. So it just didn't work out. And I, I think that's just the way it looked. It, it you know, promoting from within. And I know there's controversy of why you didn't get that 
you know, he had the title of defensive coordinator, but he didn't get the interview to be the next coordinator. That certainly uh, played a factor or the main factor why he didn't. But I, I just think ultimately, uh, regardless of reasons why, I just think the numbers just didn't do well, you know, and, and it was yeah. hard to defend a lot of guys. And and Mario, uh, Coach Cristobal has already obviously made his mind up that he wants to move forward and, and make changes. And uh, you could argue it one way or the other, but certainly it just didn't work out. And I think Honestly, we we could get more into Miami's linebacker play, but they've got to get the guys. And they bring in a Washington State transfer in Francisco Maui Noah, and I know they really like him out of Washington State. So we'll see if he can translate, and we'll see if Miami can get a better play. Wesley Besaint's a young guy to watch for there. You know, with Coach Nicholson, uh, there's a few things you touched on I want to go back to. But with Monty Montgomery in particular, his development, he was a guy that was coached by Nicholson for a while there. What, what, how did he develop in particular, but maybe also the, the development you saw with the linebackers in general? I know that Sonogo uh, was just there the year, but just maybe some development stuff that you saw with Coach Nicholson, guys in, under him. Yeah, you know, Monty Montgomery always had that it factor. He's a small player, like five. They list him probably at six foot, but he's five foot ten. You know, he's probably 217 pounds. He's just one of those dudes that, like, that you, you had to tell him, whoa, you know what I mean? Like he, you didn't ever have to tell Monty Montgomery go. Like he just go do it, undersized, you know. But with a player like that under Nicholson, like you kind of had to rein him in a little bit, you know. Like some guys run really hot, and Monty Montgomery was that type of dude. Uh, and D- Derek Nicholson did a really good job of kind of reining that in and targeting him into the right direction and in a responsible way, if you will. You know, <laughs> Monty Montgomery could be kind of reckless. Uh, Momo, I think what you saw, you know, D-Nick saw, hey, man, I got a veteran player. Uh, we needed this guy coming into the portal. They had a lot of young linebackers. Nobody really of the size of Momo. They needed a dude like that. And I think what you saw with him is to say, hey, what do you do well? Okay, you play two gaps. I'm going to let you go. I'm just going to let you turn loose. I don't necessarily think Nicholson did a whole lot except for identifying what he did well and just trying to point out a few things that he had to clean up, to be honest with you. I think it was like, all right, I know this is what you are. I know this is what you do. Go do that. And sometimes that's the best thing a coach can do. It's just (laughs) know what a guy's capable of and what he does best and just design everything around him. And I think that's what happened. Absolutely. An excellent point with coaches in general. There's a lot of different things that go into coaching. You said earlier that you felt like players wanted to play for Coach Nicholson. Why Why do you say that? Do you have examples uh, of maybe what was said from the players or why do you think it was uh, that connection there? Because that's certainly the, the biggest part, essentially, for coaching is getting the most out of the players and essentially getting them to play hard for you. Yeah, you hear that. I mean, D-Nick didn't do a lot of media with us, but we heard from the players a lot, hey, uh, that's my guy. I want to play for him. If he goes, I go, you know, type of thing. And then on the recruiting trail, uh, especially down there in Miami, I mean, you all probably are familiar with some of the prospects, Derek Nicholson being in their homes and things like that. He just has a gravitational pool. And I don't think it's like out loud, it, you know, like some recruiters like are Lane Kiffin and they want to be, you know, like photo, photo, you know, tweet and all that stuff. You're not going to get that out of him, but you have, Mario Cristobal, who will do that for the free already, you know, and, you know, Derek Nicholson's just there is a relationship guy, you know, guys like playing for him and he, they know that he cares about him, you know, and I, I'm a big fan, you know, I mean, I hated losing him to Cincinnati up there, and, you know, with Scott Satterfield. I think most, most people were happy to see like Satterfield go, but there were pieces that like Nicholson that you're like, ah, oh, dang, man, you really hate to lose a guy like that. Cause he's just, a valuable piece. And, uh, you know, I just think it's the relationship that he had got, you know, pe- when, when players know that a coach cares about him, you get 20% more than he would have otherwise. And, and, and Nicholson gets that, you know, going back to on field stuff w- with the linebacker play. And, and there's a lot that goes into it, especially now with, with defending the yeah. pass uh, and all that, but let, let's just, the, 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 the main number one responsibility is tackling for a linebacker. How would you? I know you touched on earlier this year, it was touchy at, at times, but overall, the three years there, and again, just kind of looking with Coach Nicholson, he was a GA at Louisville as well back in 2014. He kind of got his mark, uh, started his career started there. Uh, but tackling in general at the linebacker spot, how would you evaluate it? And essentially, were there things that Nicholson either helped with or uh, essentially made, made points of emphasis with that? 
Yeah, I think I think so. And I think it really came down to like the awareness of the defense, getting Monty Montgomery healthy and like getting that injury thing out of his head, I think was a big deal. And then Momo just knowing where he's doing, you know, like that that was a big thing. Because the tackling from the start of the year, seriously, go back and watch Louisville and Syracuse. This is one of the worst tackling you've ever seen in your life. And then go back to, you know, basically the Pittsburgh game forward, they were lights out, you know, exactly. And I mean, with some few exceptions. I mean, we lost the Florida State game, Boston College game, and the Syracuse game because tackling, you know, from there, it really was good. And, you know, I wish we could play, you know, four preseason games because I'd like to know what our season looked like, you know, because of that. So I, I'd say Nicholson would play a big part of it. I think some of it was just awareness, you know, you're not second guessing what you're doing. Monty Montgomery getting not not being injured or sort of getting that out of his head. But but Nicholson placed a priority on hitting, you know, with your head up. And you could see it a lot. Like when guys would tackle, there wasn't well, we had a problem with our safeties. You want to talk about our safety coach, that's another conversation. Where guys dipping their head down. You know, guys, Momo and Monty tackle with the face up, and they're also snatching at the ball. If you look at what Monty Montgomery's uh, fumble recovery, fumble force fumbles, he would hit the quarterback. The ball would, you know, he, his other arms coming down at the ball, and you know we got some turnovers off that. It was ask Sam Hartman what he thinks about Louisville's linebackers up there. <laughs> you know, he had a problem. <laughs> sure, and Montgomery the four force fumbles. I, I, I'm sure Miami would love to have that on defense at the linebacker spot, whatever, whatever that yeah. might be. So, you know, I touched on the tackling. Uh, knowing the defense certainly very important for a linebacker play. How would you say? How would you evaluate maybe him as a teacher? I, I know you touched on some things that maybe you'll you'll go back to in, in this answer, but just maybe him as a teacher, as an instructor, as, as someone to make sure you understand the defense and the responsibilities of the linebackers. Yeah, you know, critical situations. Uh, Monty Montgomery back two years back in 21 uh, went out for the year. And the very next play was a true freshman, Jalen Alderman. Pick six, touchdown. You know, I mean, guy's in the right place at the right time. He knows what he's doing. He's playing legit. Might have been his first college play. You know, non-special team. play, And he's just right there wins the game like Louisville's about to lose to Central Florida because it's deep in the fourth quarter Dylan Gabriel who transferred to Oklahoma a year later he's got the ball in his hands and you know the ball goes up Jalen Alderman is dropping and then boom game over that's that's a good example of in game three how quickly young players sort of like grasp in an emergency type situation and in football you always find yourself in an emergency situation, especially during a game. The guys were ready. And Alderman's a young, still here, young, undersized player, but he was pressed into action and won Louisville football game from the linebacker position. So that's probably the most uh, aggressive one that I'll, I'll show you. But, I mean, we've had other guys step in. Uh, you know, Dorian Jones, who just went to Cincinnati. <laughs> like, uh, I wonder if he regrets that decision. You know, because Nicholson just left. Uh, but, like, he was pressed into action a lot, especially if Momo wasn't available. Dorian Jones was in there a lot as, like, run-thumping kind of dude. Uh, and guys just seemed to be ready. You know, they really did. And Coach Nicholson, you know, with tackling, we're talking about tackling, knowledge of the game. You know, as a player at Florida State, led Florida State in tackles himself uh, his last two seasons there. In Tallahassee, you touched on recruiting. Are there some stories with recruiting that you could say um, that you know about him as a recruiter? Obviously, Miami fans are well aware of San Quan Clark was his primary, yeah. uh, you know, Coach Nicholson was his primary recruiter, goes to Louisville there, uh, you know, a local guy. But anything with recruiting with Coach Nicholson that stands out? You know, we could always see him in the high level guys, uh, you know, living rooms. That's the thing. Like, I talked about he's not really a loud guy. You're probably not going to hear a lot from him. You're probably going to see him a lot <laughs> more than you're going to hear from him. Uh, but, yeah, Stan Quan Clark, as soon as I knew Nicholson was going to Cincinnati, I was like, we got no shot at Ruben Bain. You know, I knew it. You know, I knew it. And Ruben Bain is a guy that, you know, Stan Quan's teammate, as you guys know. And I'm like, Ruben Bain's amazing. If I can get him and Stan Quan Clark, I mean, we can build a defense around that. You know, <laughs> Absolutely. So I think Ruben Bain's a baller, uh, and to have that level of guy 
you know, thinking about Louisville should tell you where, you know, Derek Nicholson is as a recruiter. You know, not like we've done well in recruiting, but we're going into Miami's backyard, you know, getting San Juan Clark and, and a high consideration from Ruben Bain. The only people we've seen do that with high level player are the guys that Nicholson's replacing, you know, and Charlie Strong. And that's over a decade ago. So, you know, kind of run Charlie went on when he was younger. Maybe, you know, maybe you get maybe you replace Charlie Strong with a younger Charlie Strong. We'll find out. Yeah, we'll definitely yeah. find out. M- Mark, I, I appreciate it. I really enjoyed this. Uh, I kind of hyped it up at the beginning that the the fans like these. You definitely delivered, so I appreciate you taking the time to do this and hopefully talk to you soon. Yeah, well, we'll see you week before Thanksgiving, and uh, we'll be down there. So we'll come see you. <laughs>